So to introduce our guest expert today, uh, Ms Joanna Frank is a consultant breast and oncoplastic surgeon at UCLH in London. Her area of expertise include assessment and management of all conditions relating to the breast and her particular interests are detection of early breast cancers, oncoplastic breast conservation, mastectomy with immediate reconstruction, family history, risk reduction and breast screening. She's also a wonderful help to OCA in regularly offering her time to our projects such as this. So really, really grateful for that. Um, I should say that Joanna's here to answer all your questions, but as always, this isn't a medical consultation. So please always consult your own medical team about your personal situation before you make any decisions on any of this. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Joanna now to take us through um, a few bits of the topic, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for a Q&A. So please do send in your questions if you have any. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, Joanna. Hi everyone, um, I hope that you can uh, see me and I'm going to show some pictures um, later just to let you know that um, patients do give permission for pictures to be seen but I think it can be a helpful um, tool to stimulate some um, conversation and questions. So uh, as it's been said, I am a breast and oncoplastic surgeon and I regularly see patients who have been identified as having a predisposition to developing breast cancer that may be a BRCA mutation, but there are other mutations and there are patients who are just felt to be at increased risk, um, so significant that they are considered to be as high risk as uh, patients who are um, BRCA, although that tends to be um, the term that most people use because it's the most well-known one. Um, patients uh, sometimes come to see me because they've got a, a concern but more often than not, they'll come because they've already been identified as being at high risk. And um, just to be to make sure that everybody's aware of the current pathway, if you have a strong family history, you should be referred up to the genetics team who will take you through genetic testing. It's very simple these days. It's often a blood test or even a spit test. It doesn't sound very glamorous, but it is very easy to do. Um, and these um, consultations are going on remotely throughout COVID and there are ways in which we can get um, blood samples without patients having to necessarily come up to the hospital. So your local GP practice can do them um, or if it is just a simple spit test, that's very straightforward to do. Um, you will have an opportunity to discuss your genetic results with a geneticist afterwards, which is really important and valuable. And what I would say to anybody who um, considers themselves to have a strong family history is that it may be worth just talking to your immediate family members before you go ahead and get tested to make them aware of it. Because if you were to have a genetic predisposition, it will certainly have an impact on your immediate family as well. For those women who I see who have been identified as having a strong family history of genetic predisposition, um, we generally talk about um, all the options. One is to um, forget that you have this knowledge and go ahead with your life and not, not think about doing anything about this, which is perfectly valid and is what some people want to do once they've gathered information. At which point, as a woman, you will be um, called for your first screening mammogram somewhere be between the ages of 47 and 50 on the current screening program. For those um, women who would like to uh, have more regular screening, then you'll be invited to go into the National Health Service breast screening program earlier um, into specialist sites who deal with women who are considered to be at higher risk. And um, I used to tell people that you'd get your first MRI scan from the age of 30. There is now a move and um, some women are starting to get them at the age of 25. There are different conditions um, for that, but you may see that some family members or even yourself are being called for MRI scans earlier. It is really important that you track your periods if you're having them, because an MRI scan is really useful to us, uh, but we need to know where you are in your menstrual cycle. And it's not the radiographers being difficult when they're trying to book you in. It's just that it's much more reliable if you have it done between day six and 16 of your menstrual cycle. Um, and for, for anybody who's not certain, because these things are not terribly obvious, day one is the first day that you bleed. Um, your MRI scan will be um, reported. Uh, if for anybody who hasn't had a breast MRI scan now, um, you lie on your tummy for about 40 minutes in an incredibly noisy machine with your breast in some very unglamorous, um, totally readily made cups. Um, I have to say it's not dignified, but it does produce lots and lots of pictures which are very helpful to myself and the radiology team. 
once you get to the age of 40, you'll have mammograms and MRI scans if you're continu continuing to be uh, on the high risk screening um, regime. And it is really important that you go for both things because they show things slightly differently. So calcification, which can be a sign of an early breast cancer or some instability in the breast, is not picked up on MRI scans. So um, I, I know that um, uh, they're not the most comfortable of things, but a mammogram is very helpful to work alongside the MRI scan. And there is a reason for both of them. Uh, some women feel very anxious about the amount of X-ray exposure from a mammogram. So just to put it into context for all of you, it's about the same as a return flight to New York, not that any of us are going anywhere at the moment, or a five day holiday in Cornwall, where most of us are going when we get the chance, because there's some increased radon naturally in the rocks there. So it is a very small amount of radiation exposure and the mammograms are very helpful. If you look at the data for the women that are going through the MRI high risk screening program, you'll see that about one in 10 women will be recalled from their MRI scan. And MR, uh, a recall does not mean that we have seen a cancer. Uh, so please don't misinterpret it if you get that call. It means that something looks slightly different to previously or one side, uh, one breast looks slightly different to another and you need some further imaging to follow that up. Um, if you look at the women who are undergoing high risk screening, you will see that there is a direct correlation between having a recall and a scare and then feeling much more certain that you may want to think about risk reducing surgery, because I think it is uh, quite understandably an extremely anxious time for people. So um, the women that I see have often already started on the screening program. Um, some of them may be a little bit too young and are waiting to start it, but what they come to talk to me about is risk reducing strategies. And what you will see in some of the older um, documentation is we used to talk about prophylaxis, but we've moved away from that. And it really is the emphasis on is it's on risk reduction. We cannot stop you um, having, a, uh, we cannot guarantee that you won't get a breast cancer, but we can reduce your risk significantly down to less than background population. Um, but it is important that you, you understand that as a concept. So um, some women will have the appropriate family history and may think about some risk reducing medications. These are a manipulation of your hormones. Um, I have to say, I I've never found patients who have really found it uh, that easy to get on with these medications. They're quite similar to the ones that we use to treat breast cancers and they do come with side effects. But for some women, um, it is a choice and uh, that they take and actually um, they, they seem to do very well on them. Um, if you are taking these drugs, it is important that you don't become pregnant at the same time um, as uh, there, there are concerns about that. Um, and um, But really what most women are coming to talk to me about is breast reconstruction. And I think that's what um, you really want the focus of today to be on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. For some women, um, the idea of uh, risk reducing surgery is very appealing. And this is often if they have themselves seen a family member um, being diagnosed with breast cancer and that can be uh, really empower women uh, to to decide that they would like to 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 have a sort of preemptive strike and make sure that they um, that they are able to um, uh, elect for surgery to reduce their risk. Um, uh, but it's it's not the same for every woman. It's not an easy choice to make and it's certainly not something that's going to be done uh, just after one consultation. Um, you will, uh, you should expect to meet your breast surgeon and a plastic surgeon on more than one occasion. You will, as part of most of the national pathways, be introduced to a psychologist who will give you some support with the decision making, um, and that is part of the pathway. Your case will be discussed at the national, regional, risk reducing, multidisciplinary teams to make sure that everybody um, is really thinking about what would be the most suitable surgery for yourself. So um, if you are considering surgery, um, it is important that you understand that there's about a year's lead time, I think, between meeting the surgeon for the first time and your operating date. Um, uh, that's certainly what we were working for in the NHS before we, um, we had COVID. Uh, obviously, the timetables for things have changed a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, between the, the, the first lot of lockdown and the current lot of lockdown, I certainly was 
again able to do risk reducing surgery on the NHS, um, but there had been some delays for people in the pathway and I'm not certain um, when we'll be restarting this surgery. Um, but screening, so that's high risk screening if you've been identified, is going on within the NHS and so far has not been stopped and in fact was never stopped even during the first lo lockdown. So whereas women who are part of the background risk screening population, things did get slowed down for the high risk patients, it continued. So if you are expecting an MRI scan as part of your high risk screening program, you will probably still be getting it at around the same time. Um, when women come to me to discuss risk reducing surgery, some will really like their breasts and some will have breasts that they never liked because they were too small or they're too big or um, over a little bit of time, uh, gravity has not been our friend. And um, most of us who are uh, a little older, like myself, um, and who have had children will know that their breasts don't look how they did um, and how they wish they still did. So there are some silver linings to some of this surgery. And sometimes we can um, produce uh, the, some uh, the reconstructions to really improve things for patients. And that's something that I really do try and work with them. So once we have established that a patient's breast health is uh, normal, uh, we start to think very much about um, uh, breast reconstructive options. Now, uh, to divide uh, reconstructions uh, most easily, we divide those into women who are going to have implants and women who are going to use their own tissue. And there are pros and cons to both. And I've got some pictures, so I might start to show some of those in, in a few minutes so that we can we can talk a little bit about it. Um, the first pictures that come up are autologous. So autologous is using your own tissue. Now, for some people, that is a real preference. Um, and um, that's something that they want because they don't want to use a foreign body such as an implant. But in order to have uh, reconstructions with your own tissue, you have to be the right body shape. Your, um, your body size, so your BMI, uh, needs to be within a normal range. So um, if you're very overweight, or you are underweight, it can be very difficult for us to um, proceed with this surgery. Uh, autologous reconstructions, depending on how we do them, can uh, be affected by other medical conditions. So things like if you're diabetic, it can affect which operation we may be able to offer you. And um, if you are a, currently a smoker or have recently been a smoker, then that will also affect um, reconstructive options. It is not one size fits all, and it really is important that you meet a, a surgeon who has a reconstructive interest and that you are also um, uh, able to meet a plastic surgeon because uh, although I have a lot of experience with reconstruction and will be uh, taking part in the surgery, however the reconstruction is done, um, it's, not, it's always the uh, plastic surgeon who has the final say on whether you're suitable for an autologous reconstruction or not. So when we're thinking about taking tissue from one area of the body to rebuild the breast, then um, we have the uh, lower abdomen, which is called a DEP, which is often um, the, most, um, the most popular of the reconstructive options because um, for many of us, our lower abdomen uh, has become uh, a little different to when we were a teenager in that we tend to gain weight there. And with pregnancy, the, um, the tissue tends to stretch and it can be quite a difficult area uh, in which to, um, to um, get yourself back to the size that you want to be. So I'm going to show you a lady who actually didn't discover that she was a, a BRCA patient um, until she was a little older in life. Um, and um, then she came to be seen and she was suitable for bilateral risk reducing surgery and she wanted to have a bilateral DEP, so that's using the tissue from her lower tummy. Um, she wasn't a smoker, she wasn't diabetic, and her, um, her uh, body shape was suitable for this surgery. Um, so it, it, for those of you who don't know um, very much about this, there is, there is very often no concern with the um, skin envelope. So there is no problem with the skin overlying the breast, so we can preserve that. What we need to do is remove the breast tissue from underneath. Now, this uh, lady wanted to remove her nipples at the same time, and so you will see that she ended up with um, nipple reconstructions, and then you can have some tattooing after that. Um, but not all women will want to have their nipples removed, and certainly you don't have to in the vast majority of cases, although it can make for sometimes a more complex approach to surgery. So. Um, 
uh, as I say, every patient has their own choices and um, this is what this lady chose. So I'm gonna see if I can share my screen, which I did practice. So I'm hoping it's gonna work. Good, uh, can, can you see that? Yeah, great, I'm getting the nods, the nods, so that's fine. So um, this is a lady and you can see that um, she has um, got moderate sized breasts and she's also got a little bit of a tummy. And then you can see her on the day for surgery with a large amount of marking up. You can see which part of the lower abdomen we're going to use. Um, it, it, the markup is probably um, the worst part of the day actually for this surgery because you're there often in your paper knickers um, with the entire team staring at you. and. Um, one or two surgeons with a, a felt tip pen and a uh, and a tape measure deciding where all the lines are going to go. So um, I can appreciate how difficult that is for patients. Um, so I'm hoping it's gonna move on. It doesn't seem to want to, even though I practiced and it said it would. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, this is um, this lady after she has recovered from her initial surgery. So you can see that she's kept her breast shape. It is a little bit smaller. She's got a scar underneath the breast that you can't see and one coming down from where the nipple is going to be uh, down for, to, to the inframammary fold. And um, you can see that where her nipples were, there's a little bit of skin. That's actually the skin from her tummy that we used to monitor her, her after her surgery to make sure that her reconstructions were healthy. And then this is what she looks like um, afterwards when she's had a nipple reconstruction made. So the scars, as you can see, have now healed very well. You can hardly see the one that's coming down from the new nipple into the inframammary fold and the inframammary fold one remains um, hidden. And she has a very um, nice symmetry. She has a good shape and her tummy uh, looks normal as well. Um, she, many patients who, when they've had a DEP, will end up with a little bit of, of extra tissue just at the edges, um, sort of around where the hips are, and that can need some um, remedial surgery. So what you need to re remember for all of this type of surgery, that this really is a journey. It's not going to be one single operation. It's going to be several to get things to the position that they need to be. So this lady had at least two operations. Um, she had her initial one and then she had the one where she had her nipples made. Now to complete this, um, we would offer tattooing around um, the nipple and then to make an areola as well. And then you'll see much less scarring and things will look normal. Um, however your nipples are made, um, they often flatten a little bit. So that is something that you need to be aware of over time. Now, the next photos I'm going to show is of a lady who uh, decided initially not to have any immediate reconstruction. Um, she decided just to have mastectomies without reconstruction. And then later on down the line, decided that she would like to have a delayed reconstruction. So an immediate reconstruction, we're allowed to, we enable us to keep the skin envelope and to rebuild the breast. And it gives very different scarring to whether you have a delayed reconstruction. Now. Some people will, um, will elect for delayed reconstructions. Uh, some people will not be given a choice because if unfortunately they develop a breast cancer, it may be that they're not suitable for an immediate reconstruction, but we can usually arrange for a delayed reconstruction afterwards. If you are going to have a delayed reconstruction, then it really is important that we can uh, bring some tissue in from another site in order to make a, a breast shape and also to give it some natural ptosis or for want of a better word, droop, because if we don't give that, then it won't look very natural. So these pictures are, are just um, with the warning that this patient did elect to have um, a, a flat uh, look to start with and then, and then for reconstruction later. So you can see that that's what a mastectomy looks without reconstruction. And you can see why many people would choose to have an immediate reconstruction. And you can see that that's the sort of area that we think um, we need to fill out. And you can see why bringing in some tissue and not just using an implant would be very helpful. This is the area on the back that we're going to use. So we're going to take the skin at the back. This is called a latissimus dorsi flap. So we're going to move this to the front to give us a little bit more skin um, in the area. And then we're going to use this with some implants in order to reconstruct the breast. And I hope you can see that actually the result is transformative from where she was before. So the scars are going to be different because 
we have lost the skin envelope to start with and we've had to rebuild things. But actually, once we have we have done the reconstruction, I think it looks uh, you know as good as you can expect for this type of delayed reconstruction. You can see that the scars have been deliberately kept as low down as possible, that the shape is nice, uh, that we've recreated um, a nipple and there has been already some subtle tattooing that's happened to make it look um, more real. So um, I, think, I think she's got a very nice result um, compared to how she was before. Um, and you can also see that she's changed her hair color. So that's exciting, new lease of life. Um, this is a, a lady who um, is a BRCA carrier and who um, did not want to use her abdomen. She wanted to have implant only reconstructions. Um, and one of the things that she wanted to be was uh, she wanted to have a slightly more fullness to the upper breast. And also to, she, she felt that her breasts had become a little bit lower over time. So um, she would like to have kept her nipples, which we did for her. And you can see that the only scarring that she has is actually around the areola. So her entire surgery has been done through an incision here. And through there, I have um, removed all of the breast tissue that I can find. To put it into context for people, the breast tissue goes all the way up to the clavicle. So I've gone all the way up there to the collarbone and into the um, lower axilla. And then we've rebuilt the breast and we've done this with an implant um, on each side. And in addition to the implant, um, we've used something called an acellular dermal mm. matrix, which is, um, um, a, a, for want of a better word, a type of mesh, although it comes from denatured um, pig skin, this one, um, which enables us to support the implant and cover it. Uh, because the thing that you that I'm very keen to try and avoid for people is a very obvious takeoff line where you can see the implant. So by using the, the, the mesh, we're able to avoid that. And um, for, for a patient like this who really wanted to have a look that was as natural as possible, she didn't want it to be very obvious that she had implants. I think I think that we've achieved that for her. So um, there are lots of different options um, that we use, and it certainly isn't one size fits all. Um, and um, some people will feel very strongly that they want an immediate reconstruction. Some people will feel very strongly that they don't think they want one, but they don't want to rule out having a delayed reconstruction. Some people will feel very strongly that they want to keep their nipples and um, some people will um, feel very strongly um, that they, they don't want to keep their nipples. So it's, it's a very, very um, different and it's a different approach for any single uh, patient that I see. Um, so uh, I think it's very important that um, patients are aware that all options should be available to them and those options are available on the NHS. Um, usually you see someone who has a special interest in this type of surgery or um, works with a group of surgeons that do. Um, uh, and very often this is done in conjunction with the plastic surgical team, which may not be, uh, which may be based at a slightly different hospital to your local hospital because plastic surgeons are often um, regionally based. So they may come and visit the hospital that you are um, being seen at, but it may be that your surgery is a little bit, is, is it's a different hospital. Um, and I don't think that should be something that puts patients off. It is really important that you go to a hospital that is used to doing this type of surgery. Um, for uh, the autologous reconstructions, things like the bilateral DEP that you saw, that operation is going to take somewhere between um, uh, six and 12 hours. For the patient, um, you'll be asleep. Uh, you will be perfectly safe for your family. It's very difficult because it feels like um, you don't hear from anyone for forever while you're waiting to get a call from, from the team. Um, the recovery rate uh, is very good, but I would say after a bilateral DEP, it's about three months until you feel back to normal. I mean, you'll be discharged after about a week and you'll be wandering around and self-caring, but I think it really does take three months before you feel like you are back to normal, you're healing in your abdominal wound and you've got your breast wounds to heal as well. You, as I said, it's often a journey and you may need more than one operation to just do some tweaks, uh, but those are very small day case procedures. And once a DEP is done and everything is settled, it is very unlikely that you will need further surgery down the line. So it's an investment up front in time, uh, but afterwards things are much, uh, are, are, are usually settled very quickly and it's very robust over time. If you gain a little bit of weight, the DEPs will gain weight. If you lose a little bit of weight, the DEPs will lose weight and they will sort of age appropriately with your frame. 
if you are only suitable for implants or would just like to have implants and avoid uh, the surgery that um, is involved with something like a DEP reconstruction, uh, then what you need to know is that um, implants also require um, further surgery, um, but it's often a bit more predictable because implants do need to be replaced over time. So you'll be thinking about every approximately 10 years that you'd have to have your implants replaced. That is again a smaller procedure. It is a day case. Um, one of the things that um, patients sometimes find with implants is that the look that it gives you in your 20s and 30s is not necessarily the one that you feel so comfortable with as you reach your 50s and 60s and therefore we need to think about some revision at that stage in order to make sure that the um, reconstruction fits your, your body shape. So there are um, there are things to be thought about for, for all um, reconstructions and there is a reconstruction for everybody if they want it, uh, but um, not everybody will want it. There is an organization called Flat Friends. It's a, a very nice and friendly um, organization and forum um, that is for women who have decided that they don't want to have reconstruction and that's perfectly um, valid and uh, patients should feel confident with whatever decision making they come to. What I would say is that it is important that you meet a team that you feel that you have an alliance with because you have to trust your team and you have to feel that the right people are looking after you. Um, if you don't feel that, then you are entitled to a second opinion on the NHS. Um, and um, sometimes patients come with very fixed ideas about what they think they might want. Um, and actually, when they have all the information in front of them, they realise that that's not at all what they wanted. So I would uh, make sure that you do gain information from professionals uh, before you make a decision, because the one thing that is utterly certain about all this surgery is that it's totally irreversible. So once we've done it, um, we can give you the very best reconstruction that we can. We can give you the very flattest chest that we can, if that's what you want, but we can't undo all of those actions entirely. So you saw that the lady who hadn't wanted a reconstruction, who then had a reconstruction, that um, uh, that it's not the same as it was before she started. Um, it's the very best cheat that we can give, and that's the same for, for every patient. So you really do need to feel like you have uh, chosen the right pathway for yourself. You need to feel like you are um, with a team that you trust. And then finally, you need to think a little bit about the timing of this surgery, um, because um, for some women, they will want and be in a position to be able to complete their family first, uh, breastfeed and then have their surgery. There will be some women who feel very strongly that they will never be able to get on with their life until they have achieved the surgery. And very often that's related to their personal circumstances their family history, um, if there is a, a, a lot of breast cancer in their family, the age that those breast cancers were being diagnosed and what they've, what they've seen um, in family members who have unfortunately suffered with breast cancer will influence patients as to what they want to do and when they want to do it. Um, the larger um, breast units and even the private units will usually be able to put you in touch with someone who can be a buddy. So someone who may um, have gone through something very similar to you, who you can talk to. And certainly the plastics unit that I work with closely at the Royal Free, we have something called show and tell, which is where women who have had um, breast surgery and reconstruction um, uh, are available for you to come and speak to um, and uh, you will be pleased to know that there are no surgeons in the room so you get to hear the real story from the patients as to what their experience was, all the things that we forget to tell you or because we haven't personally experienced it uh, don't realise are really important to tell you um, and very often um, these women who've been through this surgery will be very happy for you to touch the reconstruction and to, to really understand what it's like to, to go through the journey of deciding what surgery you want, to where they will help to support you with your decision making and they will help to support you um, during the first um, weeks and months after the surgery um, when, when sometimes uh, it, can, it can really feel like it's a little bit of an uphill struggle to get yourself back on your feet. So um, feeling in, in top form, making sure that your health is good, making sure that you're timed this surgery if you have a choice um, to when you have a little bit of time that you can um, you know, have the luxury of 
allowing yourself to recover and heal is, is really important. So those are some of the things that I wanted to say to you. I think there are probably some questions and then very often questions produce more questions. So um, let's see um, if I can answer them. Yeah, so uh, we've had a question about nipples. So I wonder yeah. if you could maybe sum up a little bit about um, the latest evidence or thinking about the safety of keeping nipples. And then the question following on from that is, you showed some reconstructed nipples. What are they actually made of? Okay, so um, if you are at increased genetic risk, but you haven't had a breast cancer, then um, the current feeling is that you are able to, um, we can spare your nipples. Um, what you need to know is, uh, um, and what most people already intuitively know is, that um, there are ducts that travel throughout the breast, which are there to transport milk, and they come right to the end of the nipple. So whilst we take away all the breast tissue that we can find, um, we will be leaving a very, very small amount of breast tissue uh, behind if you keep your nipple. Um, there is no evidence currently that that will significantly increase the risk for the vast majority of patients, but we do think about it on a patient by patient basis. Um, some women feel very strongly that they want to try and keep their nipples if they can, uh, their own ones, because let's face it, whichever ones we make are never quite as good as the ones that um, you were born with. Some people really don't like their nipples because they protrude too much or they're too flat or they've already gone in a little bit um, or um, they feel that the areola, which is the pigmented skin around the nipple, is too wide or too small. So they don't feel very strongly about keeping their nipples. If a breast is um, very what we would call totic, but um, for want of a better word, is, is a, it's become more droopy, then it can be more difficult to keep a nipple alive um, and all the skin envelope and rebuild the breast. But it is uh, possible. But sometimes we need to think about um, some, a, a different strategy or even increasing, increasing the number of procedures that you have. So it's something to discuss with your team. But certainly I feel confident in, in, in the vast majority of women to keep their nipples some women just won't want to. They won't want to have that slightly increased risk. Um, how do we make nipples? Well, uh, there are three different ways of, um, of uh, making nipples. You can just have a tattoo done um, and that actually works very nicely for, for people and you get a sort of 3D uh, tattoo. So it's sort of the illusion of protrusion. So it is actually completely flat, but it will look a lot like a nipple. Um, and you've got the areola around it. Um, uh, the advantage of that is it doesn't require any surgery. The areas often uh, doesn't have a great deal of sensation, although we give some topical treatment to make sure that it doesn't hurt when you have the tattooing. It is available on the NHS. Um, there are otherwise people who we can recommend who do nipple tattooing regularly. Um, you can, of course, go to your local tattoo parlor if you wish, um, and they very often will do a nipple for you. I've got a patient who had a very nice one done in Camden Town, but I don't know exactly which tattoo artist did it. Um, what you do need to think about is that if you're having one done for medical reasons and it's done within the NHS or by a medical tattooist, we use slightly different pigments which are not thought to be carcinogenic. There are some concerns about tattoos that are done outside of the medical profession, but certainly you'd be able to go wherever you want. Um, you can um, otherwise the ones that I the ones that I showed you are a um, a, a little local flap. So it's a bit like skin origami, to be honest with you. And we use the skin um, that is by the scarring um, in order to make it. Uh, it's a, a procedure that I tend to do under general anaesthetic. Some people will do it under local. It's a day case and we recreate a, a little nipple by folding the skin there. Now, if we are making a nipple from tissue from the back, which you saw in the lady that had the delayed reconstruction, or in the lady that had the DEP, then that skin um, has either come from the tummy or it's come from the back. And that is, they're very nice to make nipples from because that skin tends to be a bit thicker, um, the back skin and also the lower tummy skin. And so you can make quite a nice nipple and you get a good um, projection from it. Um, uh, otherwise, if you're having just implant only, we can still make a nipple, but it tends to flatten a little bit. Um, and then you get the tattooing done after it. And the other option for nipples is um, prosthetic nipples. Now, the ones that are supplied on the NHS are really not um, fabulous, I must say, but you can um, 
privately have uh, prosthetic nipples made and they stick on for 12 to 18 weeks at a time and you can have them cast on your previous nipple beforehand so they look extremely similar. Uh, I have to say that one patient completely fooled me one day um, and she had a, a fabulous prosthetic one. Um, unfortunately, the man that made it has now retired, um, but it looked absolutely brilliant. And I really did a double take. I didn't believe that it wasn't real. So, and she'd had it cast on the other side, from the other side. So they were identical, um, which was very impressive. So uh, they do work um, very well. Again, there are some specialists that um, that can help with that. You really, you really do need to um, find the right person to make one for you. That sounds so clever. Um, I really like that idea. That's brilliant. It's, it, it's, they are absolutely brilliant. Um, they're really good for patients who unfortunately have had a breast cancer and required a mastectomy and had a recon. And um, you can just never get the nipple to match. But actually, if they go for the prosthetics that's cast on the other side, they're very often done by the same people that do all the film prosthetics. You know how much they can do to transform people's faces and so on. And um, we've all watched TV programs about it. So it's that kind of thing. And they do stick on for weeks and weeks at a time. So you can shower in them, you can swim with them. No one needs to know it's there. Brilliant. Um, I've got a couple of questions about complications around implants um, reconstruction. So particularly yeah. whether you could talk a little bit about capsular contracture, how often that happens, and also things like rippling and what you can do about those if they do happen. Okay, so um, so two, those are two common things that can happen with implants. So um, we will all know people who've had implants put in for augmentation. So these are put in when um, patients would like to have their breasts bigger. And those implants are put in behind the breast tissue. So you don't see the rippling because you don't see the implant. It's really being used just to augment the size. When you have risk reducing surgery, um, the job of the breast surgeon like me is to um, keep the skin alive, keep the fat under the skin healthy and remove all of the breast tissue. Now for women who are slim, there is almost no fat um, underneath that skin and, and then you've got an implant there. And therefore you can more easily see the implant and that's when you get to see the rippling. And in fact, the rippling often looks different depending on whether you're lying down or sitting up because implants um, are mobile inside and move a little bit and so do the contents of them. So um, some of it is related to your body habitus and that's very difficult for us to change. Some of it will be related as to whether you had the implant covered with something like the acellular dermal matrix. Now, that is uh, eventually incorporated into the body um, and will help to um, produce a little bit more tissue. So it supports the implant, but produce a little bit more of tissue uh, between the skin, uh, the fat underneath the skin and the implant. One of the things that we have now that can really help is something called um, lipo modeling or lipo sculpture. So once your reconstruction is settled, if there is an area where the implant is much more visible, we are able to take fat using um, liposuction techniques, spin it down, and then put the um, fat stem cells into the area. And that will um, sort of, for want of a better word, plump that area up and support it a little bit. Um, it often requires more than one operation, but it is a day case. And when we put the fat in, not all of it will take. So about 30% of it will sort of reduce. And then, so you may need to, what may look absolutely marvelous after the first lipo uh, modeling will require um, uh, further top ups over time. Uh, most uh, women, including myself, could find an area that we'd like some liposuction. So even if you're very slim, we can usually find an area in a thigh um, or flanks works for most people, um, even if there, there isn't any other sort of fatty areas anywhere else. So, so that can help, but rippling may be a problem um, no matter what we do. We try very hard to make sure that there's no rippling seen in the upper half of the breast, um, but it, it's obviously something that women will be much more conscious of. So that's your rippling. Now, um, capsular contracture. Capsules are much, much more likely in women who have had to be treated for breast cancer, and especially if they have radiotherapy. So we expect about 50% uh, of women who have radiotherapy for a breast cancer and an implant will get some degree of capsule around it. Um, sometimes it happens straight away and sometimes it can be much later on in the day, but the breast uh, reconstruction will become firmer and more uncomfortable and the size can change. If you have had it related to radiotherapy, I would say try and wait for at least six months or if you can a year after the radiotherapy to get it fixed. Uh, because the earlier you do it, 
um, it, it can sometimes be a, a bit of a, you don't really gain as much because the, the capsule hasn't completely formed yet. So it's a little bit of a waiting game in terms of timing. Um, with capsular contracture, we can often use the LIPA modeling to help. So sometimes you will be suggested that you have some LIPA modeling and then you have your implant exchanged and we can take the, the implant out and as much of the capsule as we can as well. Um, so uh, we don't see it quite as often in, uh, as we do with patients who've had radiotherapy and women who haven't had to have treatment to the area, but it can still happen. Again, um, I would wait a little bit of time before you um, approach other surgery. For some women, uh, as much as you try, the implant just doesn't seem to, to work as well as you would like it to, and then we need to think about more autologous options. But the LIPA modeling has changed things a lot because we can inject quite a lot of fat around where an implant is, and that can really help us to soften things up before we exchange the implant. Thank you, that's really helpful. And um, I suppose um, along similar lines to that, um, the question that's come up a few times is whether women who've had implants when they're younger can later on down the line opt to swap to have a Diet for whatever reason. And how much, if someone say, well, didn't have enough um, fat in their tummy initially, how much would they need to gain to, to, you know, to be able to do that really? How many donuts does one, one need <laughs> to eat? That is the question. So uh, the first part is uh, for many women, especially um, young women who have a young family, implants will be the better option for them just in terms of timing of the surgery and ease of surgery and recovery in the first instance. And so, um, yes, you can be, uh, be uh, converted to a DEP later. And what I would say to patients is that if you have any uncertainty about what type of reconstruction you want, then go for the simpler operation first, which is the implant, because you can always get it converted to a DEP. What you don't want to do is to do a DEP and then think this was a terrible mistake. I really should have just done implants because then we have already done 12 hours of surgery and you have had um, the, the, your, your lower abdomen operated on as, as well as, as the breast. So you can do it in a stepwise um, fashion and that's not unusual to see. I would say that um, the waiting lists on the NHS for things like conversion to a DEP are uh, long um, because you can imagine that um, we've got uh, people com uh, we've got people with compelling reasons for surgery. So patients who have uh, been recently diagnosed with a cancer or just completed their chemotherapy or are having their risk reducing surgery for the first time uh, may be um, put ahead of someone who's waiting to convert implants into a DEP. It's not to be said that it doesn't happen, but just that you do you do need to be aware of these of these things. So so that that was the first part of the question. I'm sure there was a second part. Now I can't remember what it was. Um um um. No, I can't either. I've been reading through the questions to be honest. So okay, someone someone have to repost whatever the second part was that I was supposed to answer that I've got no, carried away okay. and forgotten. <laughs> um. Another question that is about um, replacing implants and if we need to replace them, uh, you know, in a reasonably regular fashion, um, whether the recovery of that surgery is less than the initial surgery that you have to have it done. Yeah, absolutely. The first surgery is by far the most difficult surgery for us as the surgical team and the one that you will take the longer to get over. So for um, recon uh, in mastectomies with immediate implant reconstruction, I would say you need about six weeks to be up and running as you were before. Um, providing you don't get any complications. And then um, the, uh, uh, the exchanges are very simple, they're day cases, and I wouldn't expect you to have more than a couple of days off work, although we would be quite strict about what you can do immediately afterwards. So if you are very into going to the gym and exercising, then we would uh, put a stop to that, or at least anything that's going to wobble the reconstructions, you'll be allowed to do probably some fast walking um, or even um, on the treadmill on an incline walking, but nothing more than that for a little bit. Um, and we really, really don't like people swimming immediately after any kind of surgery because we worry about infection. I have a whole host of patients who really like swimming in open water. So um, the pond in Hampstead is particularly popular, but that makes me very anxious because although I'm sure it's lovely to be swimming in nature, you are also swimming with duck poo and fish poo and my very fresh scars. So that makes me very anxious. So I don't allow that for a few months afterwards. Um, but otherwise you should be, it's, it's a very quick procedure just to have the implants exchanged. Right, I've seen it flash up now. I've just caught sight of it. How much tummy do you need to do it to have a DF? Well, it depends a little bit on how big a breast 
that you have or want. So um, if you are, uh, so, so it's very variable from, from one patient to another. Um, and sometimes I, I think, gosh, no, you're never going to be suitable for a bilateral DEP. And then the plastic surgeons go back and say, no, 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 they're very stretchy and I'm very happy and I can definitely get the size breast that they want. So it isn't something that's one size fits all. But if you are super, super slim um, with really no, no additional tummy tissue, then, um, then it's not going to work for you. But it's why it's really important that sometimes you meet a breast surgeon who has a particular interest in implants and you don't get to meet the plastic surgeon. So it is really important that you meet plastics to see whether they think that you have enough tummy for, for a bilateral DEP. Um, Otherwise, there are other options. They're not often so popular, but you can use the inner thigh, which is a tug flap. Um, it, the scar really is from the inner thigh right, um, right into quite intimate areas. So you have to be really keen for that one, but some people really like it. Again, there's a limit to what, what size breasts you can make from that. And then you can use some of the tissue around the, the sort of top of the buttocks as well, which is an S-gap. Um, uh, that's not done as frequently. Not all hospitals will offer it, but there, there will probably be a plastic surgeon in each team who has a, a special interest in that. So there, there are different options. It's the lower tummy that's the most popular because uh, most people, if they have some extra tissue around their tummy, would very happily um, remove it and feel that the idea of getting a nice flat tummy and using their own tissue for breast reconstruction is a winner. So, so that's often the most popular. I have seen women uh, really go at it and, um, and manage to eat enough donuts that they can make, make their, uh, enough tissue to have their, their breasts done. The problem is that if you gain too much weight, then we'll say that your BMI is too high and you can't have the surgery. So I think really speak to your plastic surgeon and make sure that you see a plastic surgeon if that's all you're interested in, to be really sure what you are or not suitable for. Um, and I suppose um, that leads on to another question that we've got about how do you get a second opinion and how do you go about seeing a different surgeon? So either for the speciality they've got or if, like you say, if you don't feel that affinity with the, the surgeon that you've met. Yeah, the uh, this idea of a therapeutic alliance is very important because you really do have to feel that uh, whatever news you get from your team, that, that it's the right person giving it to you. So to get a second opinion, you just need uh, to go to your NHS GP and ask to be referred to a particular person. And that's all you need. So it is allowed. Um, GPs sometimes don't, uh, are not always so helpful with these things, but it, it, is, it is something that's allowed. And, and you may find that um, you feel just more comfortable or more confident with one particular team compared to another so yeah your NHS GP is the person to do that for you. Brilliant thank you um I wonder if you could answer a few questions about um we've got about the sensitivity afterwards and how much feeling you have I know you mentioned a little bit about the when about nipple tattooing and how yeah. sometimes you're not very sensitive there does any yeah. of that sensitivity, sensitivity come back over time or is that it forever? So um, uh, we always say that sensation will be affected and it most certainly will be. Um, and immediately after the surgery, it feels like a very large area has been affected because uh, as I said, um, the breast tissue goes all the way up to the collarbone and into the lower armpit. So um, we're operating over a very wide area, even if it's through a very small incision. So to begin with, sensation is affected over quite a large area. What you find is that over time it gets better. It may never feel completely normal, but most of us have had an operation somewhere and find that the scar is, uh, is a bit insensate to start with and then actually it gets better. It happens very slowly. So um, the patch uh, that's been affected on you gets smaller so slowly that sometimes you don't notice and then suddenly you realize actually you're feeling much more than you did before. Um, if we remove your nipples, then obviously the nipples we make will have no sensation and they won't react. If we keep your nipples, I always say to patients that you should expect to have no sensation, but in actual fact, you may have some. Um, the worst thing that can actually happen is that you get increased sensation in the retained nipple because that actually is not fun. That's a real pain. Um, so if you do keep your nipples, you have to accept that they're probably going to be, I say to patients, entirely ornamental. So they're going to have no sensation and they're not going to react, but they're yours and the ones that you're familiar with. But, um, but sometimes patients do say that over time, and I, I mean um, year, a year or so, that they do find they have some sensation. And despite the fact that we do the same operation on both sides, it can be different how much sensation you get from one side to the other. Um, we are not identical one side 
to the other. So for those of us that wear a ring, if you put it on the, uh, the same finger on the opposite hand, it doesn't feel quite right. And uh, all of us buy shoes and one side always fits perfectly and one instantly gives you a blister and that's because your feet aren't the same either. So we're just not the same. Thank you, that's really useful. Um, we've had a few questions about the two-step option for implants. So having an expander put in that's later swapped for implants. So I yeah. wonder if you could explain a little bit about that and about why someone would choose that over direct implants or vice versa, what the benefits are. So um, in an ideal world, I would like to put direct to implant the, the, the fixed volume that's going to be absolutely perfect in each patient on the day that we do it. But in reality, Sometimes when you're in theatre, you will find that the skin is a little bit unhappy having had the breast tissue underneath removed. Um, if we're keeping a nipple as well, then the blood supply to it can be quite tenuous because that's got to be achieved. Instead of coming from the breast tissue that was attached to it, it's got to come from the skin that was around it. So if we think that the skin or the nipple uh, blood supply is going to be affected by the surgery, then we will often put an expander type of implant in first. So that gives us the flexibility to take the pressure off the skin and the nipple to allow it to heal. Um, when we're trying to make people symmetrical, um, as I've already said, the breasts are not identical. So if we have an expander, then we can adjust the amount of fluid that we put into each side. So it's a little bit variable on approach. It's a little bit variable on the quality of the skin flaps after the surgery, whether we're keeping the nipple or not. So very often we do try and go for the definitive implant, but if the, the most surgeons will say to you, we'll put in whatever we think is best at the time, what we really don't want to do is put in an implant that ends up being the size that you want to be, but so it's a little bit tight and then um, the skin swells because of the surgery and then you lose the blood supply, then you can lose the whole reconstruction. So um, it, sometimes it is that we put in an expander now, some people put an expander in that is always going to be changed if they put an expander in and some point it put in an expander that can be a definitive implant. So it can be a little bit variable. Um, it, it, it just varies from patient to patient. Um, generally, what I say to patients is you're going to is a, this is a bit about the therapeutic alliance. You're just going to have to trust that on the day we're going to do the very best that we can um, and accept that if we use an expander, it's because we feel that you'll get a better result in the long term, even if short term, we have to exchange the implant. OK, thank you. Um, a question here about um, having implants replaced over time and whether there's an automatic system of being recalled to have them replaced or whether it's just um, you wait and, and, and get in touch with you guys when you feel that's roughly the right time. Yes, yeah, so what you will find is that, um, that there is no automatic recall, but you generally know when the implants need to be exchanged because they start to look different or feel different or the aesthetic result is not as good as it was. And, and then you come and see us and we say, oh no, I think that this implant may need to be exchanged or I think actually we can make things better. Um, so, so it's definitely not an automatic recall. Currently, if you had your implants put in on the NHS as part of risk reducing surgery, then the NHS is responsible for you and your implants. So they will be responsible for exchanging them for you over your lifetime. Um, certainly nothing has changed at the moment regarding that. Brilliant. Um, and a question about the scar for the DEP um, in terms of the low tummy scar. How yeah. low down is it and how far across does it go? Okay, it is as low down as we can possibly do. So it's around a, a, the site of a low cesarean section scar, but it does go all the way across. So it will go all the way across sort of from hip to hip. Um, so um, when you are wearing a bikini to show off your beautiful flat sculpted tummy afterwards, you're gonna just have to be a little bit careful as to what style bikini you have. Because if you have one that's too high, I mean, I can't wear these things anymore. Um, but if you have one that's a little bit too high, then that scar will stick out. Um, if you are very keen on wearing that type of, um, of bikini, then you may want to talk to your plastic surgery team around whether they can adapt the scar a little bit. Um, but the reason that it's placed where it is is to give the maximum amount of tissue, especially if you're going to have bilateral DEP. So we really need as much tissue as we can get in order to do a breast reconstruction. What patients sometimes find is that the hips so the tummy might look really flat, but the hip doesn't look quite right. And so sometimes there's some lipomodeling that goes on there um, and sometimes just some tweaking of that scar. So that scar can be difficult to get perfect um, with the first operation. So 
when I said that DEPs often need a little tweak, that's what it is. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I have a question that was sent in um, before the session, but I think it's a really useful one for people listening now. Um, it's from someone whose daughter is thinking about having risk reducing surgery um, and she feels a bit of pressure to do it sooner rather than later because she's worried that the NHS might cut back on offering it. So I don't know if you can speak about whether that you think that's a possibility, whether there's anything like that in the works or whether kind of COVID um, aside, um, that everything should be continuing um, in terms of being able to offer risk reducing surgery for the near future? So COVID aside, in terms of timing, there has been no indication that patients are going to, that this surgery is going to be stopped on the NHS. So risk reducing surgery for people who've been identified as having a specific genetic mutation or considered to be at significant high risk will still be having their surgery. The problem at the moment is around um, COVID and the fact that these patients are surgery is uh, understandably at the moment on hold and therefore we're going to have patients that have been waiting plus all the new patients that are going to be diagnosed so that's that's where the hold up is going to be. Um, for young women who are facing this type of surgery I think it is really really important that you find the timing that works for you and um, try not to feel pressurized because mm -hmm. Um, you know, within a, within a couple of years, one's life can change dramatically in terms of uh, career, in terms of life partner, in terms of having children. So it is about trying to find the timing that works for each individual. And it is very much an individual thing. It is not one size fits all. Um, this is a journey that's different for every single patient. Um, and so it is about trying to to make that um work for you. As I said at the beginning, there's about a year's lead time anyway by the time you have uh, met the surgeon, met the plastic surgeon, met the psychologist, been through all the rounds of paperwork that need to be done by your team and then finally got an operating date which hopefully doesn't get changed because of something else that's happened. Um, so it's never going to be immediate no, even when you're put on the on the waiting list. Um, but um, but certainly uh, I would hate to think that young women feel pressurised to have surgery. Um, and just um, one last question as we're coming up to the end of the session. Um, a question just popped off about um, breast implant illness. Um, I don't know if you can say a little bit about that and what it is and whether it's something to worry about. So um, the things that people need to know about implants uh, really apart from in infection, capsule, rippling and so on is that they can be associated with something called anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It's incredibly rare, about one in 20,000 women that have implants in can get this. Um, and we tell people the signs to look out for it. And we uh, and it's usually treated by removing the implant in the capsule. That's separate to implant related illness, which is um, a, a very uh, wide group of symptoms that some women will get when they've had an implant put in. Um, it's very poorly understood, but for some women, the only way that um, they can get over it is to remove both the implant and the capsule. So for women who've been very badly affected by it, you will see all sorts of things um, in the wider coverage that, 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 that it has a, their life has been transformed by the surgery. Um, so, you know, uh, that it's one of the reasons why some people would prefer an autologous rather than implant based reconstruction. But again, it's not one size fits all. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. And I'm aware that there's lots of questions that we didn't get to. And I'm really sorry, guys, that we didn't cover absolutely everything. Um, I hope you all agree that that was such an interesting talk. Thank you so much for giving us your time, Joanna. I, I know you always do give your time to us and we really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And everybody who's watching, we will we have recorded this, so I'll send it out to everybody um, and so you can watch it again later. And I hope that was really useful for everyone. So thank you so much, Joanna, um, and hopefully see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.